Welcome to That Entrepreneur Life, a podcast about entrepreneurship that takes you from idea to launch and beyond. Beyond. Each week, your hosts, Andrew Lees and Clint McPherson, discuss different business topics aimed at adding value to any entrepreneur's journey. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of That Entrepreneur Life. I'm Andrew Lees, and I got my co-host, Clint McPherson, here today. What's up, man? How are you doing? Good, man. It's exciting. Um, again, big one to today. be back together. It's a big one today. A hundred. This will be our hundredth episode, and we got a special guest, you know, on the show today. That this is go- this is one of those milestones for a podcast. This shows that our hard work and dedication. We keep moving along. A lot of episodes and a lot of shows don't even get this far before they fold up shop and 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 throw the towel in. So, as I say that. You know, we have a special guest today on the show. She's a no BS business coach who's focused on helping with coaches, uh, other coaches thrive. So if you're open to making more money for your business with less stress, you're definitely going to want to catch this entire episode. But before I introduce our special guest today, I want to remind you to subscribe to our podcast and to our mailing list or our website so that you don't miss out on all the free resources we have to help you start and grow your business. With that said, I'd like to welcome our special guest today, Amanda Barrientes to the show. How are you doing today? Hey, great. That I feel so honored. The hundredth episode. That's a big deal. Congratulations. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, just kind of Clint and I were talking about it earlier and it, it kind of snuck up on us, but at the same time, it didn't. Like there's so much, you know, work and and really just being consistent. Uh like that consistency is something that we've really had to work on. And, um, but it just proves that if you just kind of stick with it and you just keep working at it and do it, you know, on a regular basis, it becomes that much easier. I think if we hadn't committed to like a weekly episode rate and we were just like, yeah, oh, sporadically, like let's throw some episodes right. here and there, we, we, we wouldn't have stuck with it. So that consistency is everything. Yeah, that's cool. I, uh, I'm on, I, I think I'm in the, I'm above 200s in my nice. podcast and I agree with you. So many people start and then they just give up before they actually build any momentum. Mm-hmm. And it's so sad because there's so many great ideas and, and, you know, podcasts and conversations out there to be had, but you gotta be consistent yeah. and stick with it for 100%. a while. Yeah. And it's kind of like the story of business in general, right? Yeah, people kind of get started with one thing and they move on to the next and the next and the next and they move all all over the place from idea to idea from marketing tactic to marketing tactic and then they don't ever really give anything a full chance so yeah yeah it's so critical this is cool have you guys read are you okay with just going with wherever yeah yeah (laughs) i was gonna ask if you i'm sure you read atomic habits have you read that book I've heard of or, it. Have not read okay. it yet. My okay. wife has has read it. Yeah, she's more of the reader than me. I I, I just sort of uh, I'll learn from her, but it's a really okay. cool concept. Cool. So it's it's interesting, and I hate it. I've read it a few times, but in it, in the very beginning of the book, he has this chart, and I can't remember what scholar he's he is referencing, but there's a chart, and he calls it the Valley of Disappointment. And so it's where most entrepreneurs, exactly what we're talking about, fail because they think it's going to be a straight line growth curve where they're like, where's no curve. It's just straight line success. Awesome. I put stuff out there and everybody loves it and they run my way and there's no challenges. But really, in the beginning, you know, you're putting a lot of time and energy and money and sometimes it's a downward curve, you know, and you're you're like, oh, dear. And so he calls that moment at the bottom of the dip, the valley of disappointment. I I always call it the valley of despair because I think that's where people really do give up. They go like, is this going to work? You know, maybe I should have shiny object syndrome and go somewhere else because this isn't working instead of just staying in the game and really putting the blinders on and hyper-focusing on the one thing that they're committed to. And then they get to have that breakthrough where it's exponential growth. But most people give up in the valley of disappointment. So I always love that image. It's just so powerful in the process of the entrepreneurial journey. Yeah, for sure. It can feel... A lot of times it can feel like you're getting nowhere and, but you're making progress. Like, um, kind of a cool visual for that was, I was watching the Olympics uh, a couple of days ago, gymnastics, and they were, saw one of the girls practicing falling on her face, literally <laughs> like she was on the uneven bars and she was flipping around and then literally like trying to get the feeling right to get as far away from the bar as she could. And then she would just fall from the high bar literally flat pancake right on her face and That's and insane. bounce up and then just do it again and do it again. And like, she was literally practicing that. And I think if we kind of in a way practice falling on our face, 
on our face in business, we're, it feels like we're falling on our face, but we're actually making progress. We're actually sure. learning something. Yeah, so true. 100%. Yes. I, I agree 100% on that because at the end of the day, it's like you got you to be willing to take that leap of faith and, to, and put yourself out there. And at the end of the day, you don't fail as long as you keep moving forward. And so I, I like to think of in my mind, it's like there's no no failure in my mind, right? It's like I can tell like I might fall short in an area that I, but if I keep going and keep and, and as long as I'm learning and I keep moving forward, I mean, you can't fail, right? It's like, again, I might have to pivot. I might have to change my train of thought. I have to, might, might have to put systems in place that, you know, better help me achieve what I want. And that's another thing I think people do, right? They get an idea and they just run with it without putting any systems and mm -hmm. they try to get ahead of themselves. And then no everything strategy. seems like everything, there's no strategy at all. So everything seems like when they get to that, that bottom there in, in that pit of despair or whatever, it's like, man, er, nothing is as easy as I thought it was. But at the end of the day, entrepreneurship's not easy, right? Running your own business, nothing's as easy. You're going to have the shiny object syndrome. You're going to have obstacles thrown in your way. You know, it's like when you have that dedicated time to do something, do it. Don't let your phone get in your way. Don't let that one person, because it's like, okay, I got two hours. But if you keep your phone in front of you, guess what? Somebody's going to call you, right? And that time, two hours that you have dedicated to whatever you're supposed to do, and you're going to be distracted. Now it's easier to talk to them instead of doing what you were <laughs> allocated to do for those two hours. And now you got an hour to do it. And you're like, oh, and that, and everything gets thrown off course. So it's, it's just one of those mm -hmm. things is like, you got to just keep Take the risk, take the plunge, and just keep moving forward. Yes, high fives. So, so Amanda, <laughs> and and we're so pumped that you're here for the hundredth episode, and and that you get to share this with us. But this is one of the staple questions we have for for every one of our episodes that that we we start the shows off with with our guests, and because we want you to take our our listeners and us back to when your entrepreneurial journey started. And what it is about entrepreneurship that really gets you fired up and moving every day. Yeah, mine started in such a roundabout way, which I'm sure many people say it was my own personal downfall. And that led me to learning for myself, which then led me to entrepreneurship. So it was for me, it was really a day that I remember very well because I was sitting on the floor crying and I was thinking, oh, wow, my life is a mess. So I had left my 15 year marriage having an affair. My next relationship wasn't working out didn't have good relationship skills. So here I am in grad school with three kids. And I had been like all day going like, where am I going to live next? Because I got to move out of this house. Boulder it was is a very expensive place to live. So I was like, oh God, I'm going to be homeless. I'm going to be homeless. I have no money. I don't, I don't have a way to increase my income because I was in grad school. My ex-husband had lost his job. So no child support. And I'm just feeling really sorry for myself and really scared. And I was like, oh my God, I'm a mess. I don't know how to do relationships and I don't know how to make more money right now. And I'm terrified. And so I just, I, I it was really interesting because in that moment, I thought like, what is the common denominator here? It's me. And I decided I got to do something different. I got to do whatever it takes to shift in a new direction. And it was really cool because I ha didn't have a lot of money. So it led to podcasts. It led to me listening to podcasts every chance I could get, like when I was cleaning the dishes and when I was taking my kids to school and when I was walking between my classes to teach and just any opportunity I had, I was like, oh, podcasts. And I, they started teaching me a whole bunch and I started like sharing it with people and they were like, wow, this is awesome. You're really changing. And it planted the, the thought, like all of the podcasts I'm listening to are coaches and consultants and teacher types. And I was like, hmm, maybe I could go in this direction. And so as I kept learning and growing, I started to also add on relationship and then wealth building podcasts. And then at the end of my grad school career, I decided I don't want to go academic. I'm going to take the leap and build a business and see what happens. And so I had, I was on food stamps, right? So I was like, I, I got to bootstrap my business and I've got, I had two months of living money saved up. And I thought if I can't make it fly in two months, two months, I'll just go get a job. And, but I was really dedicated to having that's a work. short runway. I mean, that, yeah. that's pretty impressive. Very that you made that work. Yeah, it, it was, I will say one thing that's helpful when you live in that situation, it's like, you know how to live pretty lean. And so I, and I just did everything myself. You know, I did a WordPress website and I think the only thing I really paid money for was my business cards that I went to networking events and shared. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was just like, it was just hit the ground as hard, talk to everyone I possibly could and just have powerful conversations and go like, I need a couple clients to pay my, you know, like my next, 
next grocery bill and then my next this. And so in my first year of business, I went six figures and then, you know, the rest has been history, but it was really that serious determination and dedication. Like, I don't want to go get a job. I really want to have my own business. I love helping people. And so I'm just going to take the leap and go for it and see what happens. And it was, it was a very exciting, very scary time. And I mean, just like so much learning, so much learning that year. That's so cool. So what was that first product that you were, or service that you were offering? I want just one-on-one straight one-on-one coaching. And I had, I had no idea what I was doing really. I mean, I knew I could help people with tools I had gotten and help them shift, but I really didn't know anything about marketing. You know, I went to a marketing course and I started implementing everything I could, but I was just, it was all the very beginning stages. And I just had such heart for it and dedication. Mm -hmm. And I knew like, I see other people out there making million dollars a year plus building businesses like this. There's no reason if they can do it, there's no reason I can't do it. And so I just kept holding true to that belief. You know, it was like, I see them doing it. There's no reason I can't. Yes. It's going to take time. And you know, at the time I was like, if I could just make $2,500 a month, that would be awesome. (laughs) You know? And then I did. And then I was like, Oh, now five, now 10. And it just kept going up and up and up. And I'm like, Oh, this is pretty incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And you can, with the one-on-one, you can charge more, right? Yeah. Because you're really, and that's what you need to get started. Like I think um, a lot of people think that oh, I'm going to, I'm going to invent and I do product development. So I definitely encourage people to, you know, to develop their products and to figure out how, and I help them figure out how to get them to market. Um, but if you've got like a $10 product and you know, it, it costs you, you know, a few dollars to make and you know, you're selling it on Amazon or you know, on your website that, whatever it is, that $10 product, you have to sell a lot of $10 items, you know, to make it, to, to pay the bills. Right. So, and that's cool. You can work, you can, if you have the right plan, the right strategy in place, you can, you can definitely get there. Mm -hmm. Um, and then with a product, what's nice is that you're not having to sell your time, but I mean, it's, if you can do, if you can do some consulting while you're working on your product, you know, even if it's an info product, if you're selling a $50 info product, still have to sell a lot more of those. Um, and if you just land, like you said, if you just land a few one-on-one clients, that could be it for the year even, you know, mm-hmm. depending on on sure. how much you're working with them. So I think that's, that's really good for some people to consider that that's a really great place to be and especially to start because you can generate more revenue more quickly. Yeah. 100%. Yeah, something that really stands out what you're seeing in my mind is having a transition plan. You know, it's like, I think it's interesting when people take the leap out of a job and they go like, they, some people sometimes have a romanticized idea of like, I'm going to make a whole bunch of money really fast. And so they leave, but without having a plan and going, it, do I have a $10 product or do I have a $5,000, you know, consulting fee? And which one of those is going to allow me to transition out to where I don't get deer in the headlights? problems. You know, so I help people with money blocks and in those money blocks, it's like, if your livelihood is triggered to the point of where you're afraid, you can't pay your bills, you are not going to be magnetic in your business at all. And so you don't want to do that to yourself. Yeah. You've got to be comfortable. I mean, and like, I think things do come sometimes from, I think growth happens outside of your comfort zone, which Mm -hmm. is cool. Um, but there's definitely a, like a level, if you're terrified that you're not going to be able to pay your next bill, that's like a level of discomfort that paralyzes you instead of helps you. Exactly. In some yeah. case, in some cases. So like, this is one, I mean, a badass story, right? Like mm-hmm. that right there is motivating in itself, but it, but the good thing about that too, and I hear this a lot and, and, and I see it a lot as well. And I've known several individuals that when their backs were against the wall, right? Like, Hey, guess what? Like, it's so, it's so funny how humans at the end of the day, right? will take the risk or not take the risk and never get in that factor of being fearful of not succeeding or whatever it is, but they don't even take that step because they're fine where they're at and Mm -hmm. and they'll never be able to take that next step. But even taking that next step with all the shit you had going on, right? Mm -hmm. And they keep moving forward. I mean, that right there, and then you just say, hey, all I got to do is this. But even finding the niche that you found consulting or coaching, 
the fun thing about the coaching and consulting aspect of it is your service is worth whatever somebody's willing to pay you. Mm-hmm. Right. So there's really no ceiling to it. So, so it doesn't, it really doesn't matter. Like if you, when you have that product, it, yes, it's same, same idea, same concept. But when you, when you put a stamp or a ceiling of $10 on it, that's it, you know, but like, okay, you get a, You get one client and you say, okay, this is all I need. But the next client, they're like, you're like, okay, well, I'm just going to step it up and double my, double my fee. And then yeah. boom, you land that client. You're like, holy shit, what's going on here? Yeah. And then the next person you're like, okay, that was easy. Let me, let me do it again. And then it's like, now you can get, and, and it just blows my mind, the difference that it, whether you're willing to do it for this amount or whenever you step up your game, that you just continue to elevate. And, and, and that's the, the very appealing portion of the consulting and coaching aspect. And that's why it's such a big niche right now. You see everybody getting into it. So you do have to actually weed the bull crap out, right? And, and but yeah. at the end of the day, when you first start something like that, who really knows what the hell they're doing until they do it? But you <laughs> yeah. figure it out, right? As long as you're yeah. true and you stay true to yourself in the path of saying, hey, I went through all this shit. Now let me figure out how I can help somebody and because I know I can help them. Because look at me. I'm successful right now because of my back was against the wall. I fought my way out of this corner and I have a story to share. And that right there is motivating in itself to where it's like, if she did that, I can do this, right? So I'm kudos to you, and I, and, and that that pumps me up just hearing it. Thank you. Yeah, you know something you said it reminds me. I call it the curse of the comfort zone, <laughs> because the people sometimes that are the hardest to work with, meaning they have the slowest transformation, are the people that are too comfortable. Because if mm. you're super comfortable, you're probably not going to take on entrepreneurship unless you're really enjoy that part of like, like all this parts of entrepreneurship, right? So it's like the people I see succeed pretty wildly and have rapid transformation are the ones that are pretty uncomfortable in some area. It might not be money. It might be that they're like really tired of having a boss and they want to do what they want to do. Or it might be that all of a sudden they're going like, oh, I have another kid on the way and I want to build a passive stream of income on the side. Or there's some impetus for them to get uncomfortable and go, I want to do this and I want to take the leap because if you're super comfortable, I mean, you know, optimal growth occurs at the border of challenge and support. So if you're over challenged, you're going to burn out, burn out. But if you're under challenged, you're kind of just complacent. And so you got to have that optimal moment. And so, you know, for me, it was like, I, I definitely was in that mode of like, I had a lot of fear and, and, Well, when I decided to take the leap into business, I had lived so long in stress and fear that it didn't feel any different. You know, it was like, oh, I can handle this. So you had like a jump start. You had like the entrepreneurship intro before really getting into entrepreneurship. Because (laughs) I was actually telling that to my wife the other day. It's like, I am am much more comfortable being uncomfortable. Five or six years ago, like, or probably longer, I would have really... There were some things in my business that would that ha- that like happen now that back then would have totally freaked me out. Yeah. Um, it, like I have a product based business, and if our manufacturer, you know, tomorrow was like, "Hey, I'm going to increase your cost by fifty percent," now I'm like, "All right, we'll figure it out." Yeah. Five <laughs> five year plus years ago, I would have been like freaking out, like, oh, everything. Yeah. You know, this is never going to work out. It's you know, this is a huge huge issue, but. Yeah, you get you definitely get more comfortable and the yeah. you get you learn how to sleep better too cuz in the beginning sleeping is sometimes a little rough, you know, cuz you're thinking about all the things you have to do, you're thinking about like how, you know, how am I going to pay my next bill or payroll or whatever it is, you know? So, it's you get you get comfortable with it, which is yeah, you know, the transition Definitely. I think it's like that stair stepper approach, right? Like how much heat can you take or how big can you stretch your goals? It's always like, oh, let's take some steps. And then you look back and you go, oh, wow, now I can go to this level. And then you you get to where it's more, it's easier to take bigger leaps, I think. And in, in the prices that you charge, you know, like you were saying, Clint, I think it's one of those things where your perception of your value shifts as you step into it and get experience and start to have really good results with people. You're like, Oh, this is worth a lot. Like, what is it worth for someone to pay to have transformation? You know, like 
it could be millions of dollars. One shift of your thoughts could lead to millions of dollars for a business owner. So it's like, oh, okay, what is that actually worth? So, you know, valuing yourself enough. I think that's one of the biggest problems I see with coaches and online entrepreneurs is that they don't value themselves enough. And so they undercharge and over deliver and then they burn out because they're not making the amount of money that they want to make. Right. Yeah. Cause sometimes you can, I think you can let your customer dictate what your value is. You know, I get a lot of times, you know, somebody will come to me and they'll undervalue my, my design engineering and uh, even strategy services where they're like, it costs how much that's crazy. And if you let that wear on you and you're kind of like, Oh man, maybe I should lower my prices. It's like, no, that just wasn't a good client or they just need to be educated further. I mean, I get some people who get sticker shock and I educate them and they're like, Oh, all right, actually that makes sense. Now I'm ready to go, you know, but yeah, I think it's important not to let your clients dictate it too much. Obviously if everybody says no, because of price well, then you got to take a hard look at that. But yeah, I think it's important to know your value, like you said, and, and really be true to that and stick to that. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to get a little uh, strategic here with you. Um, if you had to pick one marketing tactic to master that would help move the needle for sales in, in a coaching business or maybe even any business, what would that be from your perspective? It would be to within three to five seconds of someone coming to something of yours, them knowing who you serve, the results you bring, what you guarantee. You know, like we have, there's so much information in the world right now yeah. that if you're mm-hmm. not clear who you serve and you're not broadcasting it to them through knowing how to read their mind, you're, you're gone, you're yeah. already out of mind, you know? So you've got to really know how to hook people in fast for them to then get nurtured by you over time to build a relationship of trust. Because once you have a, a customer or a client they, and you get the results, they're, they're, mm-hmm. they're yours for life. And they're your greatest sales team because they're going to bring people to you yeah. through their results. So the biggest trick is how do you get them hooked in up front? And go like, mm-hmm. oh, I want to know more from that person or I want more products from that person. And so it's really learning how to read the mind and state it very quickly so that people don't go away when they see what you have in front of them. Yeah. Yeah. I even noticed that on your website for your service. You it, you know, it seems like you will work with a lot of different entrepreneurs who are starting different businesses or who have already started businesses. Um, but you make it pretty clear that you focus on coaches, on working with other coaches. So you're mm-hmm. not totally limited to that. But at the same time, it, it is very clear by looking through your website, even just like the first couple lines where it's like you help coaches um, achieve more success. So that's like a, a great example and just what you do um, and get it in aligning with the, the right customer. Because like you said, that is that is huge. Getting the right Getting the right clients is is super important because getting the wrong ones sucks <laughs> the life out of a business. Yes, sure. <laughs> so true. <laughs> I always like to say that your success is my reputation. So if you're attracting the wrong people and you're disinspired when you're working with them, they're not going to get results. You're going to be resentful, which means then you're not going to get good reviews. They're not going to get the results they want. Yep. And then you're just having such a detrimental effect on your company. You yeah. really want to be working with people you enjoy working with, people that you can get results for, mm-hmm. and then they it, then it, the process gets really easy, and then people are coming to you, raising their hand, like, "Hey, I want to work with you," and mm-hmm. you don't have to do any marketing work. I mean, you, I always think you're doing marketing work in your business, yeah. but it doesn't feel so challenging. Exactly. <laughs> it just feels, yeah. You get the flywheel going, and it it'll move for a while without you having to do to intervene too much. Obviously, if you want to accelerate it, then you got to do more work, but yeah, I, yeah. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. It's all about the momentum. So exactly. man, there, there are a lot of new businesses being started. It seems like all the time, especially through, you know, what we're going through with the pandemic, you know, the COVID-19 stuff going on. And sometimes it can seem, and even when I got into the digital marketing game, that there's an oversaturation of, you know, specific businesses, small businesses, whatever you want to want to call it. But what would you say to someone who wants to start a business, but they're not sure exactly what kind of business to get started with? 
Mm, that's an interesting question. First, I would say in the saturation conversation, let go of any fear around market saturation, because if you stand out above and beyond and you love what you do, you don't, you don't need a huge following, a huge number of clients or customers actually to make a very successful business. I mean, that year that I went six figures in my first year, I think I had a hundred people on my mailing list. <laughs> like, I mean, it was not... I had a tiny, I still have a tiny following in, compared to some people, right? Like, I think I'm, I don't even have 3000 Instagram followers and I have built most of my business through Instagram. It's just through really rich relationships and, and speaking to the right people and, and then charging the amount that I know I'm worth and that kind of thing. But it's, you know, I'd say for someone who's looking to get started, I always teach people to work from their zone of genius because that's where you have the greatest ability to have the easiest money-making potential potential. Because when you're doing what you love, you automatically, I mean, I don't know where you guys are at in like the whole law of attraction conversation or quantum physics or metaphysics, but it's like our body has a measurable frequency. And when you're in a state of joy doing what you love to do, you have the highest frequency, which is a really magnetic attraction, attractive quality, which means that you're going to have an easier time. Like everything in your business will just flow more easily. You'll attract more people more easily and things will feel like, Oh, cool. I get to keep doing what I love. And then the challenges that come your way, you're not as freaked out about because you're like, I love doing this. I would do this every day for free because I enjoy it so much type of thing. So when people are looking for a business, they want to start, I always say, go with what you know and let what you know grow. Don't step into an industry where you have no idea what you're doing and you don't really enjoy the process just because you think it'll make you money. That is a model for dissatisfaction over the long haul. And so, you know, of course, you know, my company's name is NFA Money. That to me, that money result, it comes from you doing what you love in your aligned energy around your mindset, your energy and your business habits. And part of that is going like, okay, if I am looking for a sweet spot, I always ask people to write a list. It's like the sweet spot list. You know, what are they good at doing? What do they, what do they love doing? What are they skilled at doing? And then what will the market pay for? And in the middle is your sweet spot where you go, okay, cool. And usually when you say, what am I good at doing? You can come up with quite a few things. What are you skilled and what do you love doing? You can come up with quite a few things. Sometimes what the market will pay for is another obvious thing. Like the market's not always going to pay for everything you enjoy doing. And sometimes you don't want to, you don't want to spend your life energy. You know, it might be a hobby versus something that you're like, I want to build a business around this. So you're looking for those sweet spots where you go like, okay, is this something for the next three to five years I would enjoy doing every day and I'm dedicated and committed to. And I know that if I stay on track it, over time, this success will be inevitable because it's enjoyable to me and the market, there's a market for it. That's interesting. It's interesting what you said about the three to five years too, because that's like a reasonable time period to figure out if what you're doing now is something that you, you know, you want to be doing for a little while. Um, but I've, but you don't necessarily have to know that you want to do that for the next 20, 30, 40 years, which I think is really important because that can be scary too. Like people feel like they need to pick this perfect thing that they're going to be in forever. I've had people ask me like, Hey, is what you're doing right now, what you want to be doing for the next 30 or 40 years? I'm like, I have no idea, but it's what I want to be doing for right now. I think I can make it, you know, a good amount of money with it. I can scale it. I can, you know, all these things, but like, yeah, three to five, maybe 10, but beyond that, you just start getting into this sort of fear of commitment um, <laughs> that I think probably everybody has. Nobody, nobody knows what they want to do for 30, 40 years. So I thought that was really cool that you mentioned three to five is like a good measurement. If you can't, if you don't know if you want to do it for three to five, not a good idea, but you don't have to worry yeah. about more than that. Yeah. You know, there's a uh, Rumi says, if you take a step on the way, the way appears. I love that quote, because I think when people step into entrepreneurship, they think they've got to know 20 years down the road. It's like, no, you've got to know the next step and stay committed for a certain number of years. Then you can decide and refine. And it might be that you stay in the same industry, but you sure. change the way you're doing it. If something like COVID might happen. And then all of a sudden you've got to go, oh, I went from speaking live to now I'm going to be an online speaker. Yeah. You know, yeah. so you might make a lot of pivots along the way and yeah, you don't have to know all the answers that gets, it does get people really scared. I think when they go like, I'm committing to this for like 10, 20 years, I don't know what I'm going to want in 20 years. And it's just like, no, decide with a couple of years and really be de dedicated to it. And then yeah. you get to make the decision 
every day, you know, you wake up and yeah. go, do I still like this? Is this still aligned? And if it's not, now you have the skills to do something else. That's the exactly. cool thing about building the skills of an entrepreneur. Like once you get, get to that first figures, it, you can build any business you want because now you have the skill set to do it. Exactly. And you might also have the following mm -hmm. to just, you know, to help guide them in, in, in a direction, you know, in the direction that they need to be guided in. But you don't necessarily have to be doing the work. Like, let's say you didn't want to be doing one-on-one -on -one consulting anymore. You could guide, maybe guide them to somebody else who is and make an affiliate commission on that. Or mm -hmm. you could start do it, having an info product or guiding them to another info product. Something, there's a lot of things like you're not just stuck now on, oh, man, I got to wake up and consult one-on-one -on -one with people yeah. every day. What if I want to have, what if I want to like, you know, take a year I can't do that if I'm, you know, consulting every day, but there's different ways that you can get around that and you have flexibility totally. the further you get. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun. I'm in my, this is my third year of business and it's exactly like you're saying, I'm like, Oh, okay. I'm going to wean down on one-on-one. -on -one. And I, now it's like, <laughs> uh, I do workshops. I do group consulting. I do yeah. online courses. You know, it's like, do you just branch out that gives you the scalability and it also allows you to organically move within your industry and what you've created in new yeah. and bigger ways that feel aligned. It's exactly. Super and you just fun. kind of feel it out. Like you said, day to day, you figure out there might be a new opportunity that comes along for you in a month that you would not have thought about, but that everything you've done so far have just led you to this point. So yeah, I think that's so cool. So yeah. Amanda, through your entrepreneurial journey from the highs to the lows, what has been the most difficult thing about entrepreneurship for you? <laughs> so such a great question. <laughs> you know, I would say the first year it was, I, I probably knowing and trusting that it was going to all work out, like letting go of the speed at which it needed to happen. You know, so there was a lot of push and fear and, and I'm one of those people, like when I set a goal, I make it happen hell or high water. And so learning to let go and relax and not forced has allowed me to every year make more money doing less work. <laughs> so cool. it's been really fun to be like, oh, I don't have to push so hard. You know, it yeah. doesn't, it's not about push. It's about strategy and it's about alignment and it's about how, getting help, you know, like hiring consultants for myself mm -hmm. and, and going like, okay, what's the easiest, fastest most fun way that I can build my business instead of the like fear-based mo being motivated of fear and like saying, Oh my God, I put this out there, this goal, like, and I have to make it happen. And so now yeah. I'm committed and scared and I don't know what's going to happen. And so as the time went on, it was like, ah, letting go and trusting was a huge, huge learning process for me. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that hits home. I really think at the end of the day, it's like, once you, like you said, I mean, once you, once you could take that sigh of relief, it's just like, you know, that you're like, okay, well I'm doing something right now because again, I don't have all that stress or that pressure, even though at the end of the day, it, it might be there, but it's not as relevant, right? It's not as like, it doesn't feel like you have the elephant on your, on your, sit on your back anymore, you know? Um, it, and it's just, you get that sigh of relief. So I really dig that. But man, as we wrap up this episode, episode 100, if you could leave our listeners with one piece of advice, what would it be? It's going to be an interesting one because it's mindset related instead of like practical strategy. But I, I always tell people your outer world is a reflection of your inner world. So if you don't like what you're getting on the outside, you have to work on what's within. And most people want to blame, you know, their partners, their friends, their parents, because society, COVID, culture, all of these things for the results they're getting. And if they really knew, like, I actually can change everything through mastering myself, they would work on mastering themselves first, and then their life would get really easy money making yep. gets really easy. And, you know, I always look at money as a tangible reflection in terms of your outer world. So if you don't like the amount of money you have in the bank, go within and start working on yourself and mm -hmm. become a master of yourself. And then your money will change. Yeah. And that can be so hard because you might think that you're doing all the right things. Like oh, I'm working so hard. Why am I not getting the results that I want that I feel like I deserve? But when you really take a look inside, you might realize oh, I'm working really hard, but am I doing the right things? And at the end yes. of the day, that's the most important thing. And like you said, you can, if you have the right strategy, if, if you've got the right game plan, the right systems in place, you don't necessarily, 
Um, we talk, Clint and I talk about it a bunch, but the whole grind mentality is, is so toxic because yeah. you don't have to get up at 6 a.m. and grind for 20 hours, you know, and drink 30 cups of coffee and I'll sleep when I'm 80 kind of mentality. Like that's the dumbest <laughs> stuff ever. And like, I, I appreciate Gary V. I like what he's doing, but you know, I think he pushes out a little bit too hard. Yeah. And you know, plenty of other people do too. And I think it's really important to make sure that you've, that you're really focused on really working smarter instead of harder. I mean, that should be where, and it doesn't mean you're not going to have to work your ass off for a really long time. That, that happens, you know, there's going to be all nighters. There's going to be some sleepless nights. There's going to be, you know, all this hard work that you, especially that you front load in a business. Um, but I, I would think that like, after a few years, if you're still working as hard as you did in year 10, as you were in year, you know, one or two, then there might be a problem unless yeah. you're, unless you're accelerate, unless you're like, no, I'm going to keep working that hard because I want to, you know, it's a rocket ship to the moon. I want to keep accelerating at that same rate. But even right. then, you know, you really should be setting up systems that help you leverage other people, other resources and other people's time. Yeah, I got to add here because, you know, you're asking what was one of the greatest lessons and it's it's all tied to these because it's I always teach people the be do have model and it's exactly what you're talking about. It's like if, if you keep working really, really hard thinking like, oh, when I get to this level, then I'll relax. It never right, right. happens <laughs> because you get there and you set the next, oh, we'll get to this next level. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. it's always about the power of presence and being present in the moment and enjoying what you're doing now because all you have is today right? Like you, those 10 years later might never come. The million dollars might never come. And it's yep. certainly going to be harder to get if you're forcing and struggling and overworking because your lack of alignment makes it harder work. So when you're energetically aligned and you go like, I get up every day and I enjoy what I do. And I don't, you know, crack the whip on myself so hard because I got to prove myself and, and have fear and terror and, you know, all those things just make it feel awful. And so, you know, it's like part of that big lesson I learned was like, let go, relax, enjoy, have fun and trust, like, you know, surrender. And, and still I take action every single day and I love what I do. And now the feeling around it, I've, I've been playing a lot with switching the word work to play. Like, Ooh, I get to play today. Let's go play. <laughs> yeah. I call, yeah. you know, the action steps I give my clients and my groups like growth play, you know, so they're playing and they're growing and it's not, it doesn't have to be this drudgerous thing that you think, when I get to that level, then I'll be happy. I've never met a person yet who that happens for because the whole time they've created the habit of not being happy, mm -hmm. of feeling overworked, of feeling stressed. So when they get there, what's actually sad to watch is they get there and they're like, oh, this isn't as fulfilling as I wanted it to be. I kind of feel like crap. And I'm so addicted to setting the next thing to always be stressed that I just set it again. And that cycle yeah. of self-sabotage never ends. And so I think of that as money blocks where people just go, I don't know how to feel good and make money. I only know how to be hyper stressed and freaked out to make money. And, yeah. and that's not what we want to create. It's like, a, it's creating a prison out of your business. Totally. Love yeah. It. I love that. That's amazing. 100%. Yeah. Well, guys, I, you heard it here. I mean, you know, you got to adjust your mindset, get your shit together. No fucking yes. around, right? <laughs> yeah. But I think it's a wrap it for this episode. And from the both of us, Amanda, we want to thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us and adding value to what we're doing on our podcast. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks, Amanda. It's, it's really been a pleasure. And thank you all so much for listening to That Entrepreneur Life. To learn more about what Amanda is working on, check out nfamoney.com. If you like what you heard today, please subscribe to our podca podcast. And don't forget to download our free ebook about the success mindset at thatentrepreneurlife.com. Thanks for continuing to support what we do as entrepreneurs. And don't forget to join us next week for another episode of That Entrepreneur Life. Thanks for listening to That Entrepreneur Life Podcast. Be sure to visit thatentrepreneurlife.com to join the conversation, access our show notes, and discover our fantastic bonus content. Don't forget to join us next week for another episode as we continue to add value. Until next time.